cloud. And it looks like it's time for us to go live. We are recording. Always takes me a moment to get this set up. <laughs> There we are. Now you'll see that we look like we're, um, there's a lag. Mm -hmm. Do you like to be called Matthew or Matt? Either's fine. I don't have a preference. I think Matthew's oh. more formal, but okay. I will call me Matt. Okay. I'll do both. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to hit go live here in about two seconds. All right. Hi, I'm Donna Sinclair, and I'm a candidate for the State House of Representatives in the 18th Legislative District. Today, I am going to be joined in a discussion by Matthew Reeves, who is a former student of mine at WSU Vancouver. Before I introduce Matt, I want to say just a little bit about why I'm doing these discussions. I think it is really important to understand who we are in Southwest Washington, and one of the best ways that we can do that is to hear from the people of Southwest Washington, to understand their stories, to understand their life circumstances, and to carry those kinds of issues um, that are raised through those stories into the state legislature. And so we can talk about policy all day long, but if that policy doesn't address the needs of the very real people who live in the, in the 18th LD and in Southwest Washington, then it's irrelevant. So that's part of the reason I'm doing these discussions. Um, it started out as an idea to get the word out about our campaign, but I'm an oral historian and this is something I've been doing for the last 20 years. I really love to hear people's stories. And um, so that is why I'm doing this. And I'm going to tell you just briefly about Matt and then we're gonna have a great discussion, I'm sure, because um, I spent some time with this young man um, in 2015 or 16 uh, is when I first met him. We'll talk about that. But Matthew is a recent graduate, a 2018 from WSU Vancouver. He has a degree in history and political science. Um, he intends to go for a master's degree in international security and foreign policy. He is currently co-hosting a radio show uh, with another student of mine, Jake Jokum, um, called To the Republic on KXRW Radio. And one of the reasons that I wanted to talk with Matt is because when I met him, he wrote an amazing paper um, that was grounded in some of the issues that he personally, I think, was really grappling with at the time that had to do with totalitarianism, authoritarianism, and who we are as a nation. And so I thought it would be really fun to kind of talk about where Matt was then and um, where he is now. So with that, um, welcome, Matt. I really, really am happy to have you here today. And I thought we would just talk, start by um, you telling us a little bit about your background, where you grew up, and how you ended up at WSU Vancouver, where we met. Of course. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, I have always lived in the Northwest. My family's from Portland. Um, originally, we moved up here when I was about three or four to Vancouver. Um, then my grandparents uh, are from Europe. My uh, grandfather's from Denmark and my grandmother's from Scotland. So I'm a second generation American. And um, uh, I originally went to Union High School um, and I went to school in the area. Um, uh, what brought me to WSU Vancouver uh, was I, I want to pursue a different degree and um, WSU Vancouver had a really good history program from what I heard and, and I uh, wanted to be kind of closer to home and I, I transferred from Linfield College to um, Washington State University 
Vancouver and uh, began pursuing a degree in history. Um, and I just kind of got, uh, for lack of the words, swept into the excitement that is local history. Um, I got to learn a lot about international history and I really realized my passion was there. And, and, and I was fortunate to have some really fantastic professors that you can relate like yourself. And, and then so many of this really inspired me to pursue um, a degree in history. Um, and so that's kind of what brought me there. And, and also, um, I, I have always enjoyed my own family's history. So I've always had some historical background in my life that kind of been around me. And I, I wanted to pursue it further. And, and fortunately, I was able to do so. Well, you and I met in History 300, which is the introductory writing class, writing about mm -hmm. history at WSU Vancouver. Mm -hmm. And I remember you coming to me and asking me if you could write about your family history. Now, mm -hmm. History 300 is a class where you learn about historiography, which for non-historians means all of the things that other people have already had to say about the past. Uh, but I encouraged you to write the paper that you wrote. So. Um, instead of me talking about it, why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, um, so part of it was based on my family's experience during the Second World War. Um, my grandfather was part of a resistance group on a small island called Bornholm. It's in the Baltic Sea um, off the coast of Denmark and just north of Poland. Um, I didn't really know too much about his story because he really didn't share too much with us. Um, I, I knew some, some details from him and, and some other stories from my family members that he had told. I um, also uh, learned a little bit about from my cousin, um, but I didn't really know about what the actual resistance groups were doing, why they were doing it, um, specifically on the island. A lot of the historiography was about the resistance groups' activities on the mainland and in Copenhagen, but um, nothing where my grandfather was from. Uh, so I um, really wanted to try to understand more, and, and not just to understand the history of the resistance, but to understand the history of my grandfather. Um, and so it, it led me down some really interesting avenues. I learned a lot about um, sort of groups because there was various types of groups. There were some that supported by communism. There were some, um, even some nationalist groups that were quasi-fascist. There were um, loyalist groups that were loyal to the monarchy. Um, some were backed by the British. So there was, there was a lot of vying interests um, at hand. And my grandfather was part of the loyalist to the monarchy. Um, he, he was very um, close. He had a strong attachment to the king at the time, King Christian X. And uh, the biggest thing I wanted to know was my grandfather was about 20 at the time of the war. I think he was actually about 22 um, when the war started. And uh, I mean, that was around the time I was writing the paper was about the time he was undergoing great change in his life. Um, one day, his country was a part of Denmark. The next day, there was a Nazi warship in his port. Um, and and the Gestapo and the SS and the Wehrmacht were um, marching through his hometown because his hometown is the biggest town on the island. Um, so it was a very big change for him and it really changed who he was as a person. Um, the war kind of haunted him throughout his life and he never really liked to talk about it, but I learned things about how he was a trained cabinet maker and he um, basically used that work to hide and smuggle weapons for the resistance. He smuggled Jews onto fishing boats so they could escape to Sweden. Um, Sweden was neutral at the time. Um, so it was a lot of what kind of sparked my interest was about these fascist movements. Um, things kind of were starting to see a little bit here with like this rise of, of some more authoritarian policies and more authoritarian um, ideals um, in the US that are kind of worrisome. I kind of started to see blending into my paper and it kind of guided me towards what I wanted to learn more about. Um, so I think that's kind of what sparked my interest in, in, in that paper. Well, and one of the things that I recall you telling me was that you had heard some of these stories from your grandfather, uh, but you didn't really have the context for them. You didn't really understand what it meant for him to be a part of the Danish resistance in Bornholm, and, and you'd heard a little bit about Copenhagen, but that, that, was, that was it. Um, so, so how did it impact you to learn about the experiences and the struggles? Maybe tell us about the struggles that your grandfather yeah. had. Oh, yeah. That's what I remember learning from you. Yeah. I mean, it was a great paper, Matt. I just want to say that it was a great paper and it was um, certainly very informative for me. Yeah, I think some of the struggles I realized were, um, but specifically tying to my grandfather, was knowing who was on your side and who was against you. Because um, it was really hard to tell, even amongst the Danes. Um, there were some Nazi sympathizers 
who were telling the Gestapo where they were hiding Jews, um, that they were trying to smuggle to freedom. And they unfortunately um, uh, caught some of the Jews that were trying to, to flee. But um, the Danish resistance was unbelievably successful and the Danish people were unbelievably success successful in um, helping the Jews escape to safety in Sweden. Um, I think some of the biggest things I learned from my grandfather specifically, he told me stories about what it was like under the Nazi occupation, um, how people would go missing. Um, there was a specific rule where you could only know one other member of the resistance at a time in case you were caught. You could only basically catch one other person if they were to um, give up information because they were being tortured. Um, I learned there was actually a small concentration camp in Denmark, um, not to the extent of like Auschwitz or, or um, uh, uh, I think it's um, uh, Treblinka, but uh, it was a more of a prisoner of war camp for the Germans um, called Forslau. Um, it was on the mainland and um, a lot of Danish police forces were liquidated and the ones who survived were sent to that camp. Um, I also learned from a primary source um, written by a Danish lawyer at the time about some things that happened after the war. Um, my grandfather had been part of some um, operations to purge um, Nazi sympathizers and Nazis who were trying to hide um, in Denmark because we look very similar ethnically. Um, they could kind of blend in a little bit better. Um, we had to, they were tracking them down and, and um, there was a specific group that would wear armbands that had the royal crest of Denmark on it. And uh, they were kind of doing some, a little bit of vigilante justice at the time. And they were rounding up um, Nazis and Nazi sympathizers. And I actually had that armband. I didn't know that was really a thing. I, I never really knew what that armband was, but I have it um, uh, at my house. And uh, I always wondered what it was about. Um, and I found out that it was because he was part of this group that would go around and try to arrest um, Nazi sympathizers and Nazi um, leaders. Unfortunately, not always was it as, um, I guess, structured as a police force would be. A lot of it had vigilante killings. Um, sometimes there were some pretty brutal methods by these people. I don't know to the extent of what my grandfather was involved, but I did know one story about a Nazi sympathizer who um, got hurt. Um, it was a leg wound because they tried to assassinate him um, earlier in the week and he got away. Um, and my, my great aunt, so my grandfather's sister, um, was a nurse at the time uh, working on him and a member of uh, the resistance and my grandfather entered the hospital room and, and, and killed him um, because he was the one who gave away a lot of positions for where we were hiding Jews um, to, uh, to for the Gestapo. Um, he basically was reporting my grandfather and other people to the Gestapo, which not just put my grandfather at risk, but put my grandfather's family. And also there was a bit of um, uh, problems within my grandfather's family. Uh, his younger brother didn't join the resistance it was about 17 at the time, and it really caused a strife between my grandfather and his brother um, because in my grandfather's eyes, uh, if you weren't a part of the resistance, you were against the resistance. And uh, my uncle Carlo, he wasn't very, um, he wasn't a violent person. He was a very sweet and nice man. And he, of course, did not support the Nazis by any stretch of the imagination, but he was also a, a, in high school. He was a kid, but in my grandfather's eyes, he was a man and men must resist and fight this oppression. So there was definitely some family strife. My grandfather had to hide a lot of what was going on from his family because if he was caught, they'd trace it back to him. my family. Even though my family pretty much knew from the get go, um, they kind of passed a blind eye to like, they were passingly accepting of what my grandfather was doing, but they couldn't say much because if they did, he could have been reported to the Gestapo or um, the SS or the German army. So. Um, it was a very turbulent time and following the Second World War and, and the Soviets occupied my grandfather's island for a short time. Uh, he eventually migrated, uh, immigrated to the US and he didn't speak English. He didn't have a, really a dollar to his name and um, he came through Ellis Island. We actually have the, um, a copy of the signature book in Ellis Island where his signature was. And so he, um, he went through that way met some family who sponsored him um, that were also distant relatives of mine. And he ended up in Portland where he met my grandmother who was a nanny during the war. And she was the one when during the Blitz, they'd send children to the Scottish um, uh, countryside. And my grandma was some of the, um, was part of the nanny group that would um, watch the children um, during the Blitz. And she came here with her employer and they met in the Northwest and that's kind of how my family got here. Um, and then several, you know, after my mom 
I came here and I'm very fortunate with the sacrifice of my grandparents um, to have, uh, bring us to such a, um, a prospering country um, after theirs was so devastated by the war. Well, and you grew up knowing your grandfather too, as yeah. I recall. Yeah, yeah, he, um, he passed away when I was 16 um, or 17. Um, I, was in high, I think I was like a sophomore or junior in high school when he passed away. Um, so yeah, I, I grew up with him. He lived um, down on Florida Street in Portland all his life. Um, I was very fortunate to be very close to my grandfather and, and I was his only grandson. So we had a very close um, connection and, and I was lucky enough to hear some of the stories of, of what it was like for him growing up. Um, and uh, it, it definitely um, left the little piece of me uh, for how to um, be an American because he was so proud of his American citizenship. He was so proud of when he finally became an American. Um, I know he he would be um, very proud of me, but also proud of what he'd done in America and, and paying for both of his children to get college educations. My uncle was a professor, my mom's a nurse. They really added to the community and, and, and that it always makes me think, you know, without these you know, proud immigrant families, we'd be missing some of our, our best and brightest. So I'm very fortunate that I was able to um, know my, my family's legacy and my family history. Well, I think uh, I, I was going to ask you how that shaped your own kind of political philosophies. And I guess what I remember is, um, I think you were in class with me in the fall. And so it was, I think it was it's either the fall or the spring. It might've been the spring of 2016. So it was prior to the election of 2016. And I just remember um, you seem to be kind of grappling with where your own political um, ideals were going to land. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, I think that's fair. I've, I've always been uh, kind of a centrist, um, but I'd always say I was more leaning towards the left. Um, but I, I grew up with a, my father's a Republican, my mother's a Democrat. Um, you know, I, I'm very, you know, privy to both sides of, of any discussion. But um, when I started to hear a lot of the rhetoric that was being, you know, tossed around, um, especially in the debates and, and whatnot, it really made me think about things that my, gra what, my what would my grandfather have said during the situation? Unfortunately, he passed um, uh, a few years before. But uh, to me, my grandfather would have been truly um, straw by some of the things that were said, especially about immigrants, since he, he was an immigrant. Um, he, I think his lasting legacy on me was to always stand up for what is right and, and not be afraid to speak out against what is wrong. Um, there were a lot of things that were said during that election cycle, during that, that time when I was crafting that paper that really crossed the line for me. And, and, and it really, uh, I had a hard time, even when um, uh, President Trump was elected, um, and coming to terms with, you know, I'm surrounded by my fellow countrymen who I, I, I love, but I, 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 it worries me that some of us are so angry and, and so um, vindictive against um, certain people that it drives them to really push for some pretty draconian um, policies. And, and so I, I was hoping to um, write a paper that at least reflected on a circumstance where draconian policies were pushed upon my grandfather and what he did. Um, and, and it's always about standing up, you know, against these, these policies that are, are, are wrong and hurtful. And, and, and not just, not to me personally, but to, to my community, to the people surrounding me. And in, in Southwest Washington, we're a very diverse community. Um, as you know, some of my um, friends at school were, were diverse and, and I, I, I felt that they were probably even more hurt than I was because some of the, the rhetoric was being directed directly to them. And uh, to me, that's where we as a community, um, whether you're, you know, whatever your standing is, you need to speak out for, for your friends and for those around you because you know, at some point, if you don't, these abuses will continue to occur. And, and um, fortunately, I think South, Southwest Washington has a very strong um, connected community. And, and though we do have our, our differences on both sides of the aisles, we do have a common identity and love for this area. And I think that's really important for us uh, going forward. And I think that's what I got from WSU Vancouver specifically, because um, you really saw that there was a big mix of ideas. 
people come from all different backgrounds, but we all work together on the same mission, and that was for each other and, and to support each other in their, in their ambitions and their uh, success. Well, I was going to ask you what were some of the things that um, WSU Vancouver provided for you, or what did that experience mean for you? Because you're headed in a direction that has to do with international security and foreign policy. And of course, you took Pacific Northwest history with me and History 300, and I think that's it. Um, so, or did you take I anything else with me? I took one more. I think I took, it was like U.S. history from 19 or 18. Ooh, okay. Present, like 18, that. 1877. Yes, 1877 to the present. Okay, right, right. I remember that. Yeah. And yeah. we, um, I think WSU Vancouver, I was fortunate to have a real diverse range of classes I took. I took everything from East Asian history, which is probably some of my favorite, to um, Northwest history, which I think is often overlooked. Because um, we grow up here and we, we really, I don't think, appreciate the richness of our history in this region. Uh, and it, it made me think about how foreign policy is important to America because things that happen in the Northwest affect things that happen around the world. And I don't think people realize that. Um, for example, when we had the trade embargo, a lot of local farmers in the Northwest were hurt by that, um, especially in Eastern Washington. Um, and so I, I think some of us may not realize that we have a really booming agricultural industry here. Our timber industry is strong. Our fishing industry is strong. We are an important region, not just in the U.S., but in the world. And, and things that happen elsewhere can affect us. But I think WSU Vancouver, I was very fortunate to have a, an environment where we promoted critical thinking, really scrupulous research, and, and pushing ourselves to dig deeper into our, our, into our studies. I really credit you and, and several other professors I had that really pushed us to dig deeper. Even when we thought we kind of, you know, hit our head against a wall, there was always some kind of thing that could push you forward to, to really bring your research um, to that next level that was needed. Um, so I think uh, Dr. Huber was just one of the highlights of my life and I really appreciate every moment I had there. I know Jake, my um, fellow host for To the Republic, and, and my friends Jeff and Angela and, and all the other students I went there really to um, appreciate the time they had with the incredible um, professors we had as well. Well, you know, um, I don't know if you know this. I think you may, because I may have mentioned it, but I actually graduated from WSU Vancouver yeah. too. But I graduated from there in 1996 um, mm -hmm. when there were a thousand students on campus. But I will yeah. say that it was, for me, a transformative experience. Um, to be there and to have the level of critical thinking and broader understanding of the world that it provided me. Um, I think one of the biggest things I learned from WSU Vancouver was that I didn't know everything. Um, I thought I knew a lot. I never, I, obviously, I didn't know everything ever and I still don't. Um, but I learned that there, there are more questions to ask than answers and mm -hmm. that we have to be open to understanding things that um, that may not agree with our preconceived notions. Uh, and, and I think that's one of the things we do in history is yeah. really investigate. Yeah, and I think that was something I wanted to ask you about too, was how your education and, and your work um, help push you towards a, a career um, or at least a, a, an opportunity to help serve those in Southwest Washington. I know um, obviously you've been detailed um, uh, historic work for Vancouver Barracks you you really um, uh, taught in depth about the Pacific Northwest. But was it about Southwest Washington in your mind that makes this specific region of the Northwest special to you and, 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 and wants you to be a, a member, um, a representative for this area? Well, that's a great question. Um, I think great context too. So I was an army wife for six years, uh, and so and I was pretty young at the time. So I had my first baby overseas in a, in a German, um, actually in an army hospital in Frankfurt, Germany. And um, when it was time for my ex-husband to get out of the military, um, actually he had a choice. We could have gone to Hawaii and spent another five years in the army. And if we had done that, we would have been in for 11 years. And if you're in the military for 11 years, the sort of general rule is you might as well go for 20 for retirement. Mm -hmm. So he, it really was up to him. It was his choice because he was the person who was in the military. Mm -hmm. And he decided he didn't want to stay in the military. So we were in Fort Drum, New York at the time, 
and he um, decided he wanted to come, we decided we wanted to come back to Southwest Washington. We had been to Germany, Virginia, upstate New York. I have family, I'd lived a year in Massachusetts with my family, I've spent time in the East Coast. And we looked at all of these places, um, places that we really liked. And when we thought about where we wanted to be, um, we had family here, but it wasn't just that. It was that the environment drew us to this place the Columbia River Basin uh, mm -hmm. and the opportunity with uh, for um, economic advancement. Um, so our family was here. We had mountains, the ocean. It's beautiful. We loved um, flying into the Portland Airport. And I don't know about you, but every time I fly into the Portland Airport, my heart kind of flutters when I see all the green. And so it's home. It's yeah. home. And so um, I won't wax on too long. I'll just say that when I in um, in 2016, I was concerned about many of the same things as you. Um, the kind of rhetoric that I was hearing uh, that was driving the political sphere. That it was, it was divisive rhetoric. It was tapping into, um, into anger and hatred instead of into problem solving. Um, how do we make a, a nation that is stronger and better? Um, it was talking about that, but doing so by using people's animosities. And so um, that was disturbing to me. And it was at the same time that I was teaching classes at WSUV. And then after the election of 2016, the spring afterward, a couple of things happened. One is I went to a uh, transportation summit with my then uh, representative, who is not the person I'm running against. Um, but when I was there, what I witnessed and began to pay attention to was the way that ideology was dr driving decision making. That decision making wasn't about listening to the people in the community um, other than a certain base, which is what I'm seeing now. It was about, uh, about sort of tapping into this is my political ideology and so this is how I'm going to vote and it doesn't matter if 53% or 47% of the people feel differently. Mm -hmm. um, I saw that. And then the other thing was uh, that spring I taught public history and I went out after at the end of the class, my students did this amazing exhibit. And mm -hmm. I think you came uh, yeah. to the I am Clark County exhibit. You were, cause those were your friends, right? You were, yeah. 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 Um, and so we did this great exhibit. And then uh, at the end of that class, we all went out for a beer afterward mm -hmm. and I was talking with them and most of them had not voted. They felt disenfranchised by uh, what was happening in the world. They felt like their vote didn't matter. And um, so it was partly what I was seeing around me and my desire to create a better community. And it was also partly that um, I realized that if I wanted my students to be politically engaged, I had to demonstrate that it was meaningful. And so, and honestly, Matt, I had kind of forgotten that motivation. And I went back and uh, reread something that had been written um, in my, one of my very first interviews when I decided to run for school board. Um, I had talked about that and it reminded me, I was like, that's right. That was a big part of the motivation. So um, anyway, yeah. we're supposed to be, I'm supposed to be interviewing you, but I, I appreciate you. I, we, we totally thought we would have a discussion yeah. too. Yeah. And, and I think the biggest reason that I wanted to ask that question is because I think it's important for people, especially voters to know that you are a very deeply rooted person in the Pacific Northwest. I mean, as you said, this is your home and you do care about the people in your community because they're a part of our community. They're our, our neighbors and our friends and, and we all are intertwined in a way that I don't think people may think about in a way that, you know, you see people on Facebook or on the news, but I mean, these are your people that you share a street with, that you, sh you share a zip code with, who, you know, though you may have differing ideas for how things can be solved, we're all in this together. And I think as part of Southwest Washington, as part of the Pacific Northwest, um, we are in a very, fortunate place. I mean, we're a great geographic diversity, biological diversity, um, diversity of people, diversity of thoughts. Um, but it's important that we all at the end of the day do care about each other. And I think for the most part, I, I, I would find it very difficult to find anyone who could argue against that. But I think we do care about each other and, and, and having someone like you who understands that and is rooted at, at their core with that, I think is, is important to have. And that's why I was so excited to hear you were running because, you know, just to have someone who genuinely cares about the community because they're so vested in the community, I think is, is really important to, to highlight. 
Well, thank you, Matt. I'm going to say one more thing, and then I want to, because we don't actually have that much more time, and there's some things I want to hear from you about. Um, but the one thing I will say is that that exhibit that we put together, um, mm -hmm. I think, really demonstrated that. It was at the Clark County Museum, and we had people who had been in the community um, all of their lives, you know, born in the 1920s, um, mm -hmm. and, and people who were more recent arrivals. And what we saw was that whether you were Muslim, whether you were African American, whether you were a longtime Caucasian resident um, from a farming community in Clark County, that we all cared about the same things. And those mm -hmm. things are our families, our communities, and people mm -hmm. were contributing. It was amazing to see the level of contribution um, that the people who were part of that, uh, that exhibit had been engaged with. And we didn't identify them for that way. They were people that my students knew for the most part, or some recommendations. So, um, so you're absolutely right. But I wanna, I wanna move back to you. Um, so thanks for, thanks for kind of bringing that out. So good job. <laughs> you like oral history too, I know. Um, so, so you graduated from WSUV in 2018 and, um, and you're working for the Social Security Department mm -hmm. and you're also getting married. So why don't you talk about kind of where you came from and what the issues are for you as, um, as a young person. I mean, most of the people I've talked with here have been older. Um, mm -hmm. I'm really interested in hearing what are the things that matter to you and just tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, um, so I've always wanted to be in public service. I think it's really important to help serve your community um, regardless of your political opinions, religious beliefs, anything like that. Um, I'm always here to serve people to the best of my abilities. Um, so, um, yeah, I was fortunate enough to get a, a job with the Social Security Administration and, and um, though obviously um, I, am, I do enjoy um, being involved in politics, my views on politics never affect my decisions and obviously anything I say here, you know, I'm just saying as a private person, um, I, 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 I think public service is extremely important. Um, I think some people may take it for granted, um, the communities they serve because uh, they may not realize how fortunate they are to be able to serve them. Um, I'm very fortunate to talk to uh, people from all walks of life um, and, and, and I'm just happy to be able to, at least it, when I can, um, bring them some um, uh, service that is fulfilled for them that they need. Um, and uh, I, it, that's where I'm at right now. And yeah, like you said, I'm about to get married. I know right now during this, um, uh, this pandemic, it's not the ideal time to have a wedding. So um, unfortunately, we may not have the great big ceremony we were hoping for, but really at the end of the day, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be marrying someone who is um, truly just all around a wonderful, loving, caring human being and, and, and who brings out the best of me uh, and, and really is just uh, the ultimate partner you could ask for in life. So, um, I've been fortunate that um, things have worked out for me in a way that many people don't get as fortunate as. Um, I know my experiences differ very, uh, or to varying degrees compared to many people in my community. A lot of people in my community don't didn't have the opportunities that I had. Um, I'm going to be getting a college education, getting a good paying um, job after graduation. I graduated with very little debt. Um, that's very uncommon. Um, a lot of people have to struggle and and a lot of people are wondering, you know, why is it that they struggle when they're, you know, hardworking people? I, I understand that it makes sense. Um, and it makes me worry, like, why isn't our community doing more to have each other's backs? Um, especially people who are doing everything right. They're working hard. They're balancing maybe going to school or being a parent. And, and, and it, it makes me worry because I want people in my community to thrive. I want them to, um, reach the best of their abilities and, and have a network and a community that cares about them. And so I, I, I'm, like I said, I'm very fortunate to be in a position where I can serve people and, and, and help their lives be a little bit easier. But um, I'm only one person and it takes a community to help a community. And so I think this election cycle is so important because we're seeing things with protests and, and um, the economy that really are, are self-directing and making us do some inner reflection about what is it we want as a community? Who are we? And what ideals do we stand for? I think the important thing I want to see in our local representatives is people who care about the community, who aren't doing this just for, you know, to be part of a party or to, to do it for, you know, money or to get, you know, donations. 
I'm for people who just they care about their neighbors and they want their neighbors to be safe and, and, and looked out for. And I think that's the number one thing that got me into public service. And I, I, I see the same things in you and I can tell that you have those feelings as well, that you want to serve your community because they're your community. And I think a lot of us young people, I think there may be some um, disconnect between some older generations and, and my own who think that all we care about is, as the younger generations are, you know, money, instant gratification, stuff like that. But I, I really don't think we're that dissimilar when we actually start talking. Because I think we all do care about the same things. It's just we may have different ideas of how to get there. Um, at least that's my, my take on at least my generation, at least from the people I've interacted with at school and in the public. We do all, I think, at the end of the day, have very similar um, hopes for our community. Well, I love that because um, there's a lot of, there are a lot of people who say negative things about people who work for the government. And mm -hmm. now that you work for the government, um, you probably heard it before and you probably hear it. I don't know if you hear it differently now, but um, public service is something that I learned about from people who worked from the, for the U.S. Forest Service. So my mm -hmm. dissertation work and a lot of the work that I've done has been through interviewing um, forest service workers and former forest service workers from the 1920s through the present. And uh, almost everyone I knew felt really committed not just to going to work every day to make a paycheck, but committed to um, their contribution through public service to the national forests, whether they were people who believed in building roads and cutting down trees, or whether they were people who were wildlife biologists and more focused on conservation. They had that commonality of a real commitment to public service. So I spent a lot of time thinking about public service um, because I grew up in a household where that wasn't really, um, it wasn't really much of an option. Uh, we were just struggling to make it. And so public service was sort of extraneous, but I'm always grateful to those people who um, are engaged in public service. And so I love what you said about the commonalities between the generations. That's one of the things we need to do is have people who are older talking to people who are younger. So you're probably, you're probably generation Z. Are you a Z? Is that what, what do they say now? Um, you're not a millennial. No, I'm, I'm, so I was born in 94. I think okay. Gen X or Gen you're X. Okay. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. I, I'm part of that generation that, you know, the digital age, you know, generation, the one that grew up on the internet. But I think, I think when it comes down to it, we're all just individuals and we're all people. And, and, and though we, again, we vary in maybe our ideas and beliefs, I think there are some central ones that we all do agree with. And um, I think in Southwest Washington, we don't see that dramatic of a tip in the scale of ideology. Um, I think Clark County is actually pretty split down the middle about 50-50. It's really, there's not that big of a difference between like Democrats and Republicans, for example. But I, I always get kind of frustrated when we just boil down beliefs to just two parties because I think we as people are more than that and our community is more than that. We're a community of, of everything. And, and, and I hope that we, and I, I do truly believe that we, we view each other more than just the sum of any one part, um, but we're a collective that is ever changing and growing and, and but in the end we'll always change and grow together. We'll never do it apart. Um, we have to be together because if, we, if we're not, um, there truly won't be any substantive change um, when we need it most. Um, so I'm hoping that if nothing else, people realize that we're not that um, far apart from each other. We just have to really reevaluate how we interact with each other. I think that's the biggest problem is how as a community do we interact with each other? How do we show that we're engaged and involved? And I think my generation in particular, it's important for us to get out and vote because we, the younger generation historically don't. Um, and that's a shame because I know some people say, well, my vote doesn't matter because I'm in either a blue district or a red district and I'm in the minority group. But that's not really what the vote's about per se, it's just to win. It's to get your ideas out there so people know what people want and what people don't want. Um, and if we, if we don't vote, we're throwing away that opportunity and we're missing out on an ever important part of our democracy. Um, if people don't vote, people who abuse democracy can take advantage of that. Um, so it's important for us to, 
and as in my generation to get out there and vote and, and, and engage more. Um, though it may not always be the most fun and, and most rewarding experience because you always run into things that are challenging, it's, that doesn't diminish its importance. Right, right. Well, and one of the things that, um, that voting does that I think a lot of people aren't aware of because of the kind of hyper focus of, of our media on federal level issues is when you vote, you're putting people in place at all levels of government. And those people tend to impact your daily life. Um, people, whether it's at the, um, the city level or the county level or the state level, they tend to have a larger impact on your daily life. Um, than the, what happens with the president. And yeah. so, um, and that's something that certainly being involved in local politics has really cemented for me. Um, there, there are elections that have been lost by three votes, three mm -hmm. votes. So mm -hmm. even if your vote doesn't necessarily tip, um, tip either way when it comes to who's elected president, it matters, it matters a lot. Um, so we actually, it's about time for us to wrap up. I wanted to um, ask you, uh, what would you want me to address in the state legislature? What issues um, are most important from your perspective? I think some of the big ones, um, I like transportation. I think we all know in Southwest Washington, getting to and from work, especially if you're commuting over the, uh, the Columbia is pretty um, arduous. And I think we're all hoping for some um, upcoming you know, transportation bills or, or allotments that allow us for constructions of more bridges or expanding highways. Um, another big issue that I think no one really talks about as much is the homeless crisis. Um, especially, I know a lot of people think it happens in Portland, but there's actually a very sizable homeless population in Southwest Washington. Um, and it's, it's uh, something I, I don't think people um, may think about all the time, but I think it's fairly important. That we do because it's um, it, no one really has a great answer to solve it because it's it's so complex. I mean, it involves a lot of things from abuse to drugs to uh, mental health, um, all, all all varying ranges of, of, of problems. And and I, I'm hoping we have someone here who can bring a a um, solution um, or the start of a solution to this issue. Um, I also worry about um, schools. Uh, I've seen a lot of um, concern from parents, but especially right now, how schools are going to operate, um, budgeting for schools. I, I know we've seen um, uh, a lot of programs um, lose funding, especially in the arts, um, but also things in like um, shop and, and mechanic stuff and, and people who, who want to pursue more of a vocational um, training uh, in high schools. We've seen a lot of cutting there, which is really disheartening because so many um, aspiring mechanics and carpenters and electricians and plumbers are losing oppor opportunities at critical points of education um, and hands-on learning. Um, things of that nature to me are really important because um, I know our community really values those things um, and, 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 and are worried about those things. So I'm hoping we can elect someone who um, is responsive to these issues and, and will push for um, some type of solution for these issues. Well, th those are actually the very issues that I'm focused on. Um, especially things like housing affordability and homelessness, new infrastructure projects, which includes issues having to do with broadband um, mm -hmm. for education access, and then really getting kids ready for the 21st century um, through career technical education, through partnerships. We have such great institutions here in Southwest Washington that we can draw from. And if we can put together the kinds of public-private partnerships that will make it possible for us to invest in future technologies, um, mm -hmm. that then we can actually do things that address global climate change, clean air, clean water, clean energy, and create a sustainable future. So. Um, so I'm glad to hear that those are your issues too. And of course, you're, you're coming face to face with people through the Social Security Administration and really seeing what their, their issues are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, though I don't get to, obviously, I, ne I never am able to, you know, really talk about things like this at work. Um, uh, one thing that I do hear from people is that, you know, what's going on with COVID-19 and, and, and the struggles with um, losing employment and and they're just looking for help. And um, it's a very hard time for people. And though I can only offer them so much, it's important to know that when we vote for legislatures, um, they're the ones who are representing us and, and, and showing what we need as a community. Um, and, and, and though I, you know, 
no one person um, on my end can, you know, say sway a vote. Um, as a collective, we are the ones who push for change. And, and if we really want change, um, we need people to, to vote with that change in mind. Right, right. Uh, we need people who are going to pay attention to the most vulnerable and ensure that we have a strong economy. So, well, thank you, Matt. Um, I would love to keep, I could talk with you for, for another hour easily, um, but I kind of, I've decided these need to be relatively short. And um, so I'm going to go ahead and stop recording here and stop streaming. Uh, okay. Let's see.